Well, you can think of Fakir Mohan as the novelist as historian. Even when he was dealing with imaginary characters, um, imagined settings, um, imagined relationships, he is actually trying to dramatize the unfolding historical process. So, even when he is not dealing with real life characters, like say in Lachamaya, Bhaskar Pandit. But what about the craft of this novel? Because in the novel, Fakir Mohan refers to uh, Sanskrit aesthetic principles, European concepts of realism, even to Uriya popular literature such as uh, Nattu Chori, Bhutakheli. Uh, does he appear to revel in this uh, anarchic, carnivalesque literary landscape? Colonialism actually meant for Fakir Mohan and for many of his contemporaries the displacement of many knowledge, existing knowledge systems. In fact, he has written a whole poem, uh, a poem about returning from a marketplace, Mohata Bahuda, I am returning from the market. And he sees the whole colonial uh, education system, cultural system as a marketplace right. where Western knowledge has displaced Eastern wisdom and Eastern knowledge. Hello and welcome to Likhawat. I am Gautam Chaube, your host, and this is a show about the books of Bharat. The book this week is an Uriya novel, Mamu, a novel that portrays the great social changes taking place in 19th century Odisha. It dramatizes destinies that cling precariously to an older order and trade warily towards a new one. It's a novel about shocking betrayals, about sympathies, about friendships, about kindness. It's a novel about Katak, about Odisha, about India. The novel is authored by a man who is widely believed to be the greatest writer of Odia language and literature, who is also called the Vyas Kavi of Odisha. The man is Fakir Mohan Senapati. And to discuss this work, we have in the studio the translator of Mamu, Professor Jatindra Kumar Nayak. Professor Sahab, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a distinct pleasure to be here. Um, I look forward to discussing this wonderful work of fiction with you today. Thank you, sir. Uh, for people outside Odisha, Fakir Mohan Senapati is perhaps the most representative figure of Uriya literature. But for the Uriya people, he's much more than that. He is an educationist, a reformer, a renaissance man. As someone who has translated three of his books, uh, his autobiography, the novel Six Acres and a Third, and Mamu, uh, how do you look at this larger than life figure of Fakir Mohan Senapati? Fakir Mohan Senapati is uh surely one of the most remarkable uh, cultural figures of Odisha and India. Uh, he is more than a mere writer. So whenever we think of him, we think of Fakir Mohan Senapati as a witness to a world in flux. And he led a remarkable life. Uh, he, he was an orphan. He spent an impoverished childhood worked in, uh, worked as a servant uh, in a sale making uh, concern and later uh, received very little formal education. In fact, he dropped out of school because of his poverty. Then he taught at a school, taught himself Persian, he is an autodidact. He taught, received very little formal education and taught himself Persian, uh, Bengali, uh, Hindi, of course he knew Urdu and taught himself Sanskrit and later uh, in his life he also taught himself Telugu. So, he is a polymath, polyglot and uh, he was a colonial administrator. He introduced print culture to uh, Balasor uh, in these, uh, the 60s of the 19th century. So, he is a remarkable human being who was a witness to a world in flux and uh, left his mark in many spheres of um, cultural life as a writer, as a printer, as a publisher, as a writer of textbooks, as a colonial administrator who uh, put down uh, peasant and tribal uprisings. And uh, he was an innovator in many areas uh, of cultural life. So, such a remarkable uh, cultural figure uh, of course appears larger than life and um, he has also contributed to this uh, process by writing one of the most fascinating autobiographies right. in which he has uh, detailed a uh, world in transition and his own role in uh, changing that world, his role in shaping that world and also tells us uh, in a fascinating way how that world shaped him. So, as a witness, 
as an innovator, as a creator, I think he is a remarkable figure right. and therefore he always appears larger than life. His life is far more right. uh, enthralling than a work of uh, fiction. Right. So Let's reflect on the title of this novel. It's called Mamu, which is maternal uncle. And in the Indian society, uh, to be a Mamu is to shoulder uh, a great burden, uh, which is not just social or filial, but even sacred. To wrong one, sis one sister or her children is uh, is an unpardonable sin. We have Indian society examples of uh, very kind mamus, but mm. also mamus who are menacingly dangerous like Kansh. Yeah. What is your take on the title and the titular character? Yeah, this brings to mind his, the title, very resonant title of his first novel, uh, Six Acres and a Third, which is centered not on a person, but on a precisely measured piece of land. Right. So there Fakir Mohan is talking about um, man's changing relation to land and land turning into commodity. So there he is talking about a series of displacements, how landed property changes hands right. and the legal system that allows this to happen right. and its human consequences. But when we come to Mamu, the title assumes great significance. He is moving from that very large world into the world of familial relationships as the very title right. suggests. So he's moving, he is focusing on the destiny of a single family. Right. So family becomes the site where human relationships are explored. But that family is also impacted by large scale historical transformations taking place all around it. So in a way he is moving into a more intimate circle. But within that intimate circle, he is not romanticizing or sentimentalizing it, just as you pointed out. Mamu can mean a loving uncle, a loving brother of your mother. It can also mean Kansa, who is out to kill uh, his nephews. But the world of familial relationships, as they are affected by, as they are impacted by a rapidly changing world, rapidly changing economic and social milieu, that I think gives this uh, title its particular resonance. Right. Fakir Mohan, as you also pointed out earlier, uh, took a great deal of interest in history. Uh, he's considered a master of historical fiction. He wrote Lachama, which, is, which has its setting in the 1750s, six acres and a third in the first four decades of the 19th century. And this novel, Mamu, dramatizes events that unfold between 1840s and 1880. Uh, compared to the other two, how different is Mamu in terms of its treatment of the historical subject? Well, you can think of Fakir Mohan as the novelist as historian. Even when he was dealing with imaginary characters, um, imagined settings, um, imagined relationships, he is actually trying to dramatize the unfolding historical process. So even when he is not dealing with real life characters like say in Lachama, Bhaskar Pandit and the Marathas, Ali Bardi Khan, the Muslim Nabab, even when he is not talking about people who lived in real uh, world, in the real world, he is still talking about historical processes. How larger the historical processes shape the destinies of ordinary individuals. So even when they appear to be living out their daily lives, mundane right. lives, large social forces, large historical forces are actually shaping their lives, giving them directions over which they do not have any control. So in Mamu, he is actually talking about the society of Odisha right. uh, in the, the period between say 1840 to 1880, roughly that period. Yes. So uh, this is the time when I think uh, in Samana Artagunt you are dealing with the period immediately after British occupation of yes. Odisha. So that world uh, was very different from the kind of world that you the early come across. Of 19th century. Yeah. So the middle of 19th century, you are coming to close of the 19th century, there you notice things are changing. So education is now playing, a modern education, western education is beginning to play a very important role. In Samar Atagon, most of the characters are actually unlettered. Right. In fact, when a murder case is investigated, most of the characters are unable to sign, put their signatures. Right. Only one or two characters are right. literate. Right. And those who are more educated actually begin to appropriate property. But here in this world, the city comes to dominate. Right. 
Samana Atagunta, six seconds and the third. It was the rural world which dominated the narrative. Right. The city was a far off place where only lawyers and judges operated. Right. And it, it was identified with jails and courtrooms. Right. And here, schools and colleges are important. Most of the important characters are actually those who have received modern education. So the way Western education was changing attitudes to life, changing attitude towards community, changing attitudes towards family, and creating certain responses in characters, that's very important. So in a way, he is still writing a historical novel, right. even when he is not talking about right. uh, real life figures. Right. But what about the craft of this novel? Because in the novel, Fakir Mohan refers to uh, Sanskrit aesthetic principles, European concepts of realism, even to Uriya popular literature, such as uh, Nattu Chori, Bhutakheli. Uh, does he appear to revel in this uh, anarchic, carnivalesque literary landscape? I think the most important uh, contribution of Fakir Mohan to realistic fiction in Odia, or if you think of the larger Indian context, is the creation of a very special kind of narrator. Earlier, I think when literature was confined to entertaining people right. or giving them only aesthetic delight, right. we, uh, the reader was a passive receiver of uh, experience, receiver of uh, attitudes, receiver of views. Right. So here, suddenly you have an aggressive, garrulous, intrusive narrator who is constant like a puppeteer, constantly playing with the characters and the reader's response. So the reader cannot afford to be a passive recipient of impressions right. and views and ideas. So what he does, he negotiates between the Western emphasis, the emphasis of Western realistic novels and facts, right. on dense specification of details, right. on uh, giving uh, particulars of time and place and causality. That's one. Of course, he read Robinson Crusoe and Bengal peasant life, and he certainly owed a lot to the Western uh, realistic tradition, where all these elements are extremely important. But he's also deeply rooted in the storytelling traditions, the narrative traditions of India, where orality is extremely important, digression becomes very important. Uh, so where I think causality uh, is, is conceived of in a very different way, so their time, notion of time can be very cyclic, where suddenly uh, themes are introduced which have very little to do with uh, uh, Western realism. So he is negotiating between two different narrative traditions right. and uh, makes most of both. I think gets the best of both the worlds. So you have the vitality of the oral tradition, right. the carnivalesque uh, element that you find in oral tradition. Right. And you also have the emphasis on causality, on portraying a uh, world that is actually available in time and space. Right. So he is trying to blend these two uh, traditions in a very, very successful and creative manner. Right. Another comparative question. Mm -hmm. uh, in Six Acres and a Third, we see an old feudal order comprising zamindars who could not trade in land displaced by a new order of zamindars who are basically money lenders. And this new order too is subsequently outdone by uh, a, a group of people who represent law, lawyers and judges. What is Mamu's position on the question of British law? I think um, in Chamana, at the center of uh, the narrative of Chamana, Atta Gunther, six seconds and a third, is the idea of land becoming property or sellable property or land becoming commodity. Man's relationship to land changes. So this novel, Chamana Athagund, actually dramatizes a series of displacements. The Jamindari or the estate changes hands rapidly right. from the traditional landlord to a Muslim trader to a moneylender, then right. finally to a modern lawyer, a Western educated lawyer. So law dominates that novel. So there are 21 references to uh, court cases in right. that novel and right. lawyers are compared to spiders and jackals right. and uh, judges are presented as utterly absolutely insensitive to. And there is uh, this very amusing anecdote about how people thought that the court case in the novel is a real case and they uh, throng to get cut yeah, up. Yeah, in his autobiography he talks about how people uh, wrote bullock cards to watch <laughs> the court, uh, the case being tried in the right. Sessions court. So, but when you come to Mamu, uh, the maternal uncle, 
you move into a different world. As I told you, the, the world has narrowed to a family. Right. So the destiny of a family, an aristocratic family, are two families. So here, there is the only one state is in question. Right. One, the, the fate of, the destiny of one state is at issue. So here, a young woman marries uh, an aristocrat, a feudal uh, lord, uh, a jamindar, and her brother, who has received modern education, and is now employed in a law court, is a an all collectorate office as a nazar. Once his brother-in-law dies, he tries to appropriate that, he fraudulently take that jamindari from his sister's the widowed sister's hand. And he is the titular mamu. He is the he is the titular <laughs> mamu. So that's where he becomes consul. Right. He tries to cheat his sister, try to cheat his nephew. So here the fate of a single estate is at stake, is at issue. So here the world has narrowed in that sense. In Fakir Mohan is talking about civilization, what change happens to languages, that Sanskrit is replaced by uh, Odia, Odia is replaced by English, Sanskrit is replaced by Persian, Persian is now replaced by English. So he is talking about, he is talking about Clive, he is talking about uh, the whole fate of um, the, the colonization of India. But here I think the focus is on what modern education, western education does to a rising middle class. In some instances, it opens their eyes to a wider, better, more civilized world and possibilities are hinted at. Just as his brother-in-law, the Jamindar, reads books on agriculture yes. and would like to improve the condition of his Farmers. tenant, but he dies. But the other characters, particularly the central character, here the villain is the hero. Right. The titular character, the, the novel derives its title from not, not the hero, but the villain. <laughs> so who, who, he is the product of a new education system. Right. But the new education system does not instill greed in everyone. Right. But he is the representative of a particular kind of man Fakir right. Mohan is now watching the emergence of. That even in Samad Atakund Ramachandra Mangaras, he is the isolated economic man to whom only wealth, only money, only material uh, goods meant something. The acquisitive man. Acquisitive man, possessive man. And this is a more refined version of that. He is the urban version of Ramachandra Mangaras who can do anything to his sister, to his nephew, to his relatives, to the villagers in order to grow rich by hook or crook. So this kind of man is the Fakirman hints that the kind of education system, the kind of legal system that was put in place are also responsible for this kind of, right. uh, the, the emergence of this kind of, this new kind right. of man, right. the isolated economic man or the acquisitive individual. But he does not blame Western education entirely because there are a lot of good characters who have also right. received the, uh, the nephew. Right. Uh, is, is a good human being and he is now going to college after right. doing well in his entrance examination. Right. So right. the tone I think is far less severe than in Samadhanta. Yeah. Uh, horoscopes and almanacs also play an important role uh, in this novel. In fact, the famous Odia critic Notobara Samantare has written quite forensically about the horoscopes of Mamu. In fact, the, the lives that the characters lead are rein rendered faithful to the astrological predictions about them. Um, if you look at realist fiction in general, uh, horoscopes and almanac are dismissed. They are not considered as genuine, but uh, Fakir Mohan seems to celebrate them as uh, genuine science of the future. How do you look at horoscopes and almanac? I think this is a very good question and I cannot give a very satisfactory answer to that, but Fakir Mohan's attitude to the whole thing is fascinating. Uh, colonialism actually meant for Fakir Mohan and for many of his contemporaries the displacement of many knowledge, existing knowledge systems. In fact, he has written a whole poem, uh, a poem about returning from a marketplace, right. Mohata Bahuda, I am returning from the market. Right. And he sees the whole colonial uh, education system, cultural system as a marketplace, right. where Western knowledge has displaced Eastern wisdom and Eastern knowledge. So he does not see them one as superior to the other. 
he said that well in this market those who wear trousers are better than those who wear dhotis <laughs> so the poor school teacher abadhan has been displaced by and byron and shakespeare have displaced say uh, bhavabhuti and kalidas and so he thinks of his he's very uh, astutely uh, notices uh, the fact that uh, the colonial world is a marketplace where knowledge systems are being displaced right. one knowledge system is backed by power that and even in mamu you find two knowledge systems right both i think a western knowledge system yes. called medicine right so the traditional even in chaman article the traditional vaidyas traditional kaviraj the indian ayurvedic system is dismissed in fact he laughs at them in fact vaidyas and the the, the always the british doctor is better than them so they come and save the lives of important characters in fact mamu not a bar sends a vaidya right who could have killed uh, his, his sister, sister. Yeah. and uh, one of the or another relative sends for a british doctor right. who comes and diagnoses it as melancholy melancholy and she survives so there he is very very favorable to he is very very uh, rec receptive uh, about uh, western uh, knowledge system called medicine but when it comes to horoscope right he thinks that well horoscope that there is something called destiny and indian traditional knowledge system perhaps has an insight into that but if you again take a holistic perspective on fakir mohan senapati he cannot be dismissed as or regarded as a mere fatalist because when he translated charitamala by ishwar chandra vidyasagar these are the stories of lives of great western achievers right there he says that i translated this because i want people not to believe in fate to believe in their own abilities as human hard work mm -hmm. so you this is as you said his is a far more complex sensibility it can accommodate tradition and modernity and let them coexist in very very um, interesting and intriguing ways uh, so the same man who believes in astrology or at least in this novel uh, shows how astrological predictions come true uh, can also believe that human beings shouldn't be fatalists right. which brings to mind the 25th chapter of the novel the assembly of the pandits which in turn reminded me of another chapter from o chandu menon's famous malayalam novel indu lekha where the narrative breaks and the characters take uh, rescue themselves from the action to debate issues of national and international relevance politics Uh, in the case of indu lekha over here it's the various schools of religious philosophy in india how do you look at such chapters and why those such chapters are important what role do they play i think they play a crucial role because i just pointed out how the theme of education is central to this novel and in everything that fakir mohan wrote he is dramatizing as i told you portraying a world in flux that one many systems are being displaced and other systems are taking their place so fakir mohan is not just a mere novelist he is a negotiator he is negotiating between tradition and modernity without rejecting either it's not a simple minded acceptance or rejection of anything he finds a lot that's good in western like uh, western medicine he but do you think the narrative arc is interrupted to educate the readers oh he is constantly interrupting the narrative arc because it's a digressive narrator but here at least he he has done that twice or thrice in this novel yeah. when he introduces minor characters right. like eli right. galai or dakapodiyama right. right. so sometimes he does that because uh, in his world minor characters acquire a great vitality right and they because he is portraying a world right. he is not telling a story in a very structured way right. he is portraying a world in which a negotiating between the new and the old right so modern education western education is a disruptive force but it is also a liberating it has a great liberatory power so at the same time, modern education should not be rejected it should not <coughs> it should be complemented by right what is best in traditional knowledge so this whole assembly of pandits where he is discussing all the systems of indian philosophy is actually his way of complementing trying to supplement right modern education which alienates some of his characters from right because in another novel prashit a character gets completely alienated he says that well i have read herbert spencer and mill and i have forgotten uh, all about my great sanskrit uh, authors and all therefore i got right i i strayed from the path of virtue so he's trying to he's a great reconciler here right. 
So even when he's so that his readers do not suffer that fate. Yeah, see that <laughs> his readers do not uh, reject one in favor of the other, because he can be also equally harsh about people who right. are obsessed with the past. Right. Reject modern right. knowledge, like as I told right. you, the case of Western medicine. Right. He right. is. He wants Western medicine to uh, have a greater impact on our life, and the Vaidyas and Kavirajas should be given a free hand. Right. Similarly, he wants what is best, all that is best in this inclusive. Uh, you must have noticed that his philosophy, the, his version of Indian philosophy, is an inclusive right. version. It doesn't reject. Right. It accommodates as many schools of thought as possible. Right. So he said that well, this the, India was uh, an inclusive world. Uh, intellectually as well as philosophically, so we can accommodate all this modern knowledge right. without losing our roots, without turning into rootless, alienated right. individuals. Right. So I think that uh, performs that very right. important function right. there. Uh, Professor Nayak, there is an interesting character in the novel, uh, Nakfodia's mother, uh, who seems to have a special talent for uh, tying the top knot and stroking vanity of people in the city. She is described as a woman of Katak. Katak is a place where several others come and thrive. What does it mean to be a person of Katak, a Katakia, <laughs> in 19th century Odisha? Ah, very difficult question to answer, but I'll um, suggest that I think in Mamu, unlike in Chamana Atagun, Katak dominates the narrative landscape. In a way, it didn't. It was, of, as I told you, a far off place associated with. Uh, greedy lawyers and heartless judges or jailers. So, the city is now emerging as the site where negotiations take place, complex negotiations and cities where destinies are made. So, cities also the place because of the impact of colonialism, because of the disintegration of the rural world, right. agrarian world, I think lots of people's lives become precarious. Right and they find themselves adrift right. in an urban world without the rural world sustaining them. Because there are other characters in the novel who are very, very, live a very precarious life, but at least there is a sustaining right. uh, system of right. rural right. world which helps them survive. Here you find a woman whose son is dead. She must have come from a village, but she finds herself in this alienated city and there is no framework of support, no sustaining framework. And then she makes a living right. by catering to the needs of the emerging middle class, women who would like to look to have a very stylish bun. Right. But it is a highly precarious life. So this new precarity that the urban world is generating and the victims of the disintegrating uh, agrarian world, they get they drift into this world. And uh, Fakir Mohan is, as I told you, portraying a world in flux. So you have many such characters whose lives are now precarious and they make a very, very precarious living uh, depending on the new emerging tastes. So fashions are changing, a new middle class is emerging which is based of which, which is supported by ill-gotten wealth. Uh, so all this world also finds its own victim. So, this uh, drifting character, this character who is adrift in an urban world uh, helps Fakir Mohan to… But how does Katak compare to Calcutta? Well, Katak uh, uh, was an overgrown village. Sure. If you think of Calcutta was the second uh, city of the empire and Katak was just uh, an overgrown village. But from the point of view, someone who lived in a village in 19th century, Katak was a metropolis. <laughs> but this was the site where uh, as if the law courts were there. College was there, uh, some trade was going on. So, obviously, this was something very, very uh, fashionable, very, very alien to people who lived in an agrarian world in a remote village which did not have roads or electricity. Or So, this is a world, I think electricity was not also there in 1871, <laughs> but at least gas lights. Right. So, this was a glamorous world from the point of view of someone who comes from and particularly one who is a victim of right. uh, a disintegrating. Uh, agrarian world. So, I am sure Fakir Mohan is looking at that kind of precarity. Professor Nayak, thank you for talking to us and for your accessible insights into the world that Fakir Mohan lived in and the world that he creates. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Thank you viewers. I am sure you have loved today's episode and I am also certain that it won't be long before you will be reading 
or rereading Fakir Mohan Senapati in the Odia original or in translation. To watch our previous episodes, check out the Likhavat playlist on Sunset TV's YouTube channel. I am Gautam Chobe. Namaste. सनसेट टीवी के और भी प्रोग्राम्स देखने के लिए सब्सक्राइब करें हमारा यूट्यूब चैनल और हाँ इन्हें लाइक और शेयर करना ना भूलें